The year was 1945, and across the smoldering ruins of Berlin, Soviet engineers were running through abandoned factories like hunters tracking prey. They weren't looking for survivors or treasure. They were hunting blueprints, prototypes, and machines that could change the fate of an entire empire. What they found that day would spark one of history's most audacious technological campaigns. At the heart of the Kremlin, a directive had been issued months earlier. Stalin understood something profound about power in the modern age. It wasn't just about territory or ideology anymore. It was about machines, about the steel birds that ruled the sky and the engines that powered them. The West had leaped ahead during the war, and the gap was widening. Soviet intelligence officers had returned from missions across Europe with fragments of a bigger picture. American B-29 bombers flying at altitudes their fighters couldn't reach. German jet engines screaming through the sound barrier. British radar systems that could see through darkness and clouds. Each advancement represented years of research the Soviets simply didn't have. But what happened next wasn't just theft, it was transformation. The Soviets didn't simply copy Western technology. They dissected it, understood its soul, then rebuilt it according to their own philosophy of warfare and production. This was an industrial espionage as we know it today. This was reverse engineering, elevated to a national survival strategy. Consider the story of the Tupolev Tufer bomber. In 1944, three American B-29 Super Fortress bombers made emergency landings in Soviet territory after raids on Japan. Under international law, the Soviets should have returned them. Instead, they impounded the aircraft and dismantled them bolt by bolt. Andrei Tupolev, one of the Soviet Union's greatest aircraft designers, received an impossible order. Reproduce this bomber perfectly. Every rivet, every wire, every gauge. But there was a catch. Soviet industry used the metric system. American aircraft were built in inches and feet. Factories had to retool entirely. New aluminum alloys had to be developed because Soviet metallurgy couldn't match American standards. Even the paint and rubber formulations required months of chemical analysis and testing. Teams of engineers worked around the clock, measuring components with calipers and micrometers. They photographed every junction, every weld. When they encountered materials they couldn't identify, chemists ran spectroscopic analyses to determine composition. The landing gear alone took three months to understand fully. The pressurization system was like decoding an alien language. Two years later, the 2-4 flew for the first time. Western intelligence was stunned. At the 1947 Aviation Day Parade over Moscow, dozens of these bombers appeared in formation. The Americans initially thought the Soviets had somehow stolen their actual B-29s, but these were new aircraft, built entirely in Soviet factories. Stalin's impossible deadline had been met, yet the 2-4 wasn't a simple clone. Soviet engineers had made subtle improvements, they strengthened the bomb bay doors. They modified the defensive armament with their own cannon designs. They adapted the engines to run on Soviet fuel grades. This pattern would repeat itself across dozens of technologies over the following decades. The jet engine story reveals even more about Soviet methodology. British engineer Frank Whittle had pioneered jet propulsion, and by war's end, Germany had operational jet fighters. Soviet designers' new jets represented the future of air combat. They acquired several German Jumo and BMW jet engines as war spoils, along with German engineers who suddenly found themselves working in Siberian design bureaus. But the real breakthrough came from an unexpected source. In 1946, Britain's labor government, hoping to build goodwill with Moscow, actually sold the Soviets several Rolls-Royce, Nene jet engines. British officials believed the Soviets lacked the industrial capacity to reproduce such sophisticated technology. They were catastrophically wrong. Within months, the Nini engine had been completely reverse-engineered as the Klimov RD-45. Soviet metallurgists had analyzed the nickel-chromium alloys in the turbine blades. They'd measured the precise angles of the compressor stages. They'd even improved the fuel injection system for better performance at high altitudes. By 1947, the engine was in mass production, powering the MIG-15 fighter that would shock UN forces over Korea. American pilots flying F-86 Sabres encountered an adversary that shouldn't have existed. The MiG-15 could climb faster, turn tighter at high altitude, and had cannons that could shred a bomber with a single burst. Intelligence analysts scrambled to understand how the Soviets had closed a technological gap that should have taken a decade. The answer lay in a unique Soviet approach to engineering. Western designers often pursued perfection and cutting-edge performance. Soviet designers prioritized reliability, mass production, and adaptability to harsh conditions. They would take a Western concept and ruggedize it, simplify it, make it soldier-proof. This philosophy created weapons that could be maintained in mud, snow, and desert with minimal tools. Look at the AK-47 assault rifle. While not directly reverse-engineered from a single weapon, it synthesized concepts from the German STG-44 and American M1 Garand into something entirely new. 
Mikhail Kalashnikov created a weapon with loose tolerances that could function when caked with sand or frozen solid. It represented Soviet engineering philosophy perfectly. Good enough to work every time was better than perfect, but fragile. This pattern extended into electronics and computing. When the Soviets acquired early American computers through intelligence operations, they didn't just copy the circuits. They adapted designs to work with vacuum tubes. They could actually manufacture reliably. Soviet computers often lagged in raw performance, but excelled in durability and resistance to electromagnetic interference. Critical for military applications. The space race provides perhaps the most dramatic example. Soviet rocket technology initially drew heavily on captured German V-2 missiles and the engineers who built them, but Sergei Korolev and his team rapidly diverged from German designs. They created rocket engines using different fuel combinations, simpler staging mechanisms, and more robust guidance systems. When Sputnik beeped its way across American skies in 1957, it rode atop technology that had been reverse-engineered, reimagined, and perfected through Soviet methodology. Even in defeat, the Soviets learned and adapted. When American U-2 spy planes violated Soviet airspace with impunity through the 1950s, flying too high for interceptors or missiles, Soviet air defense forces studied every radar track and optical sighting. They analyzed wreckage from Gary Powers' downed U-2 in 1960 with the same intensity their predecessors had applied to the B-29. The intelligence gathered informed the next generation of surface-to-air missiles and high-altitude interceptors. This technological chess game drove both superpowers forward. American engineers knew Soviet designers were dissecting every captured weapon and crashed aircraft. It forced continuous innovation. The Soviets knew they would always be one step behind in some areas, so they focused on making their versions more suitable for their strategic needs. The result was decades of parallel evolution in military technology. What surprised me the most wasn't just how detailed technical books on cold war reverse engineering improved my experience with understanding this era, but how everything started to feel different once I switched to the right one. I didn't expect such a clear change, and honestly, I tested more than a few before finding what actually worked. This isn't a promo or sponsorship, just sharing real results that made a noticeable difference for me. I'll leave the link below, in case you want to dig into it yourself and see what you mean. The legacy of Soviet reverse engineering extends beyond the Cold War. Modern China has followed a similar path, studying American stealth fighters and building their own variants. Iran has reverse engineered captured American drones. The fundamental principle remains unchanged. When you can't innovate from scratch, you learn by dismantling what others have built. Then create something adapted to your unique requirements. There's a deeper lesson here about human ingenuity and adaptation. The Soviets faced impossible odds, playing catch-up against economies and industrial bases that dwarfed their own. Yet through determination, clever engineering, and a willingness to learn from adversaries, they became a technological superpower. They proved that understanding how something works can be as valuable as inventing it in the first place. This story reminds us that progress isn't always linear or original. Sometimes the greatest innovations come from taking existing ideas and reimagining them through a different lens. The Soviets looked at Western weapons and asked not just how do we copy this, but how do we make this work for us, in our climate, with our resources, according to our strategic thinking. That question, asked tens of thousands of times across Soviet design bureaus from 1945 through 1991, shaped the modern world in ways we're still discovering. It's a testament to what's possible when necessity drives creativity. And when engineers are given impossible problems and told to find solutions by any means necessary. Tell us which country or city you're watching from. See you in the next video.